Hello, everyone, and happy International Women's Day. On behalf of the Women in Digital team and everyone involved in today's event, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our second annual ISG Journeys event on International Women's Day. I want to thank you for choosing to spend your time with us today. I know your time is valuable. We do not take this for granted. My name is Cherie Jones, and I will be the moderator today. We also have a great lineup of ISG leaders who have so graciously agreed to join us as panelists. And they are Jen Stein, Joyce Harkness, and Tracy Lipasek. Throughout our event, we will answer some questions live through the chat box feature. So if you have any questions, please be, sir, please be sure to send them through in the chat. If you have a question that we did not get to today, don't worry. We will collect these questions and make sure to follow back with you um, as soon as we can, okay? So without further ado, we're going to jump right into the action and get this event started with a few rapid fire questions to help loosen us up a little bit and get to know our panelists just a little bit more. I'm going to ask the panelists if you could just answer in the order in which you were introduced. So Jen, Joyce, and then Tracy. And keep in mind that these are rapid fire questions. So we want the answers to be from the top of your head and brief. Okay. So here we go. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Definitely dogs. Dogs. Uh, dogs. All right. Do you prefer social you prefer time social or alone time? time? Social time. Alone time. Alone time. Okay, here's one. What is your go-to lazy dinner? When you don't want to do Hamburgers. anything, but you have to eat. Hamburgers, that's a good one. <laughs> An omelet. Okay. Pizza. Pizza, yes. That's my go-to as well, Tracy. All right. What is your... Oh, actually, sorry. Is your bed made right now? No. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I will say mine is made, but that's more because of my husband and not because of me. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you, ladies, for participating in our rapid-fire questions. I thought that was fun, something to kind of take the edge off. Um, all right, so I kind of just want to start with a really simple question and learn about how you all got started. So, you know, what was your first professional role and what did it teach you that sticks, to, sticks with you to this day? And anybody can answer that question is for the whole panel. Cherie, uh, I'll, I'll go first. So um, my, my first professional position um, was as a result of some work that I was doing, some part-time work that I was doing in college. So when I was in college, I was working as a part-time recruiter. Um, the local college that I went to had an employer that would um, bring in um, college students to do recruiting. Uh, the, the idea was you'd be in your class during the day, and then in the evening you would do recruiting. You would be calling people after they got off, off, for, off of work. So I had this as a college, a college job. One of um, my colleagues, um, after they graduated from college, uh, went and got a professional job and they recruited me to come in in, um, in a recruiting human resource, human resource role. And I was actually still in college when I started my, my uh, traditional career, traditional career. Oh, nice. Okay. Thanks, Jen. Joyce, what about you? Well, I was a process engineer with a semiconductor firm, Fairchild, the grandfather of semicon companies in Silicon Valley. But I was hired in the Philippines. And uh, the wonderful thing about that was um, it came on the heels of a rejection from a large firm. I was in, a, in the top 10 of the class and I never even got to an interview and that really devastated me. I, I don't know why they wouldn't interview me, but for this particular role, they advertised for mechanical engineers and electrical engineers and I graduated chemical engineering. 
but I decided to send in my CV. And obviously, it stuck out <laughs> because it didn't have the primary requirement, which was in bold in the ad. And they looked at my CV and it was passed on to the manufacturing director uh, who was an American in, mm -hmm. assigned to the Philippines. And he wanted to see me. And guess what? We were speaking for an hour and 40 minutes. Wow. It was so enjoyable. Uh, it was like people of like minds. We enjoyed the conversation to, from, you know, of course, chemical engineering and what I do and what I did, what I liked, to philosophy, to approach to. I've forgotten, but I knew that it was imprinted in my head an hour, 40 minutes of an enjoyable interview. First lesson, just do it. Mm. Um, you know, if you want to, to go for something, just because it's not, you don't meet the requirement doesn't mean you're not the right person for the job. Because what he did was reorganize the engineering department to fit me in. <laughs> that was the first lesson. I have a second lesson, if I can share it, sure. um, was that I was just a problem solver. So I was connecting engineers to engineers across the division because I just, you know, shared like he said this and you did this and does that solve it? And in the end, it led to a, a role in, um, in California. Um, they asked me to lead the process design to... Um, you know, semiconductor assembly for surface mount devices. So second lesson, just solve the problem, mm -hmm. follow the dots, connect the people. Nice. Perfect. So just do like Nike and just do it. And then also <laughs> try to solve for the, for, for X, I guess. All right, Tracy, what about you? So my first professional role um, came about a little bit of a, a weird way, so to speak. So I had graduated from college and I did not have a job lined up. And my dad worked for um, EDS at the time and he put out a few feelers to find someone who might have something that would fit me. And so um, it secured me an interview. And this interview was to be a visual basic developer. I had not taken any visual basic in school and I didn't know anything about visual basic. So I had a technical interview scheduled uh, within a couple of days. So uh, back then you really didn't Google very much. That probably says a lot about me, but um, I went and bought a book and I read a book on how to code in Visual Basic. And I went to the technical interview and I passed um, and I joined this company, which by the way, was uh, with a company called Sintel. And it was a position in North Carolina where I knew only this one person who had worked for my dad at one point in time. And I live in Michigan, so that's a little bit of a hike across the country, a uh, tiny bit. And so I went for it. Um, so just like Joyce, I, boy, going in, I didn't have all the skills that they wanted. I didn't have visual basic certifications or experience or, or anything like that. Um, but I, I was confident I could figure it out. And so I dove into the details, passed the interview, and I moved within a week to 10 days after that. And I went there um, with my, my mother and I drove down there and I did visual basic development. And that turned into lots of different IT roles. So very similar to Joy. So even if you don't fit the criteria, you might be just what they're looking for. And I will tell you, I think I did a few months of visual basic development and then I moved on to COBOL, um, believe it or not, and um, some other different platforms as a, as a part of my role. And uh, you just never know the twists and turns that are going to happen. So that's why you yeah. really just got to, you got to go for it. 
You know, and you, you both of you uh, just reminded me, there's a statistic that exists out there, right? That says that uh, men often go for jobs when they are only 60% qualified. And women, they usually um, wait until they're 100% qualified to go for the job. So if I'm hearing you guys correctly, uh, you're saying, you know, just go for it, have confidence and just try it out and see what happens. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I, I think that's exactly, it, it's worked out well for me. It sounds like it worked out well for Joyce. I, I think the other thing, now that you've moved, many of us have moved on in our professional careers. My, my trick is to always think about what is that requirement and how does it map to something I have done? So mm -hmm. in the example I gave you about Visual Basic, you about Visual Basic, while I wasn't a Visual Basic developer in college, I had done some Fortran. So, and that also is a very old language. So <laughs> Joyce is smiling. So maybe she remembers too, but I had done some Fortran development. I'm not a computer science major, but I knew that I had done that. So I could certainly take the concepts and apply it to something different. And that's, I think the, the key to remember is you may not know everything, but for many of us, you've done flavors of something that is very mm -hmm. similar and relating those things together can really help with confidence and being able to demonstrate, well, maybe not something very specific, being able to relate it to something that you have done and have been able to do successfully. Jen, mm -hmm. Joyce, do you have any reaction to what Tracy just said? Actually, my daughter uh, came across that came statistic across. too, and she just and she just got a new job. And when it was her turn to uh, prepare for her performance review, it struck her that she was marking herself down for not being perfect. Oh. And you know what her motto is? And she, she laughed when she related it to me. She said, I kind of mentally gave myself a pat on, the, on my hand, mom, and said, think like a man. <laughs> <laughs> And and so she, you know, she reframed her self-assessment and fast forward, she was right. She was at the top of the cohort. Wow. Though she wasn't perfect, she was at the top of the cohort. Imagine if she downplayed her achievements right. because of what she felt. Yeah. So I agree. It does, it does, I don't know what it is, but somehow women just want things to be all perfect and we just need to adjust yes joyce that's that's my observation as well um, of perfectionism and having women um, feel that they have to have all of their i's dotted and t's and t's crossed before you know they take a take a step um, but I loved loved hearing uh, Joyce and Tracy uh, about both of both of your both of your stories of how you got how you got started and it wasn't in the areas where you where you expected. So this this the same with me when I took that recruiting job I wasn't done with my four year degree I wasn't going to take it I didn't have a I wasn't majoring in anything related to HR or human resources but it was a really good opportunity with a fortune 500 company that was bringing me in. And um, I was given um, additional response responsibility and did finish my degree while I, while I really started um, my professional career. Yeah. And it also sounds like there is, an, so it's not just, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. It's not just jumping into the abyss and saying, okay, I'm going to make this work, but thinking through your own personal strengths, thinking through, to your point, Tracy, the things that I have done in the past that could possibly be transferable to this particular role. Mm -hmm. So so this is kind of a tricky question and along the same question I, I already asked, but is, is that even, are we still playing it safe in doing that or is that playing it smart? So I'll just, uh, I'll start again here. I, I think it's, Playing it smart because you do want to have confidence when you are, again, coming back to the scenario you described, which is, you know, meeting only a small set of the qualifications. 
I think you want to make sure you're setting yourself up for success. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that I always say is get comfortable being uncomfortable. So, you know, you're not always going to know everything, but um, there, there is limits to reasonableness, I think. And you want to have confidence in yourself and you want to be successful. So some of that is now in both of those points, you don't need to meet 100% of the criteria, but you've got to have at least a way to ensure that you are going to have some level of success. So, Mm -hmm. you know, for example, right now, if um, I were going to go apply for a position and be a machine operator, I That would probably be a struggle for me. Um, I'm not as mechanically inclined as I'd like to think I am. And so that would be problematic. Now, um, you know, could I make my way to some of the qualifications? Maybe, maybe. but I, but I know based on my own self-assessment that my chances of success are probably a bit more limited, but if it was something I really wanted to do, then I think also it comes into, okay, if that's what I want to do and that's where I want to progress my career, what can I do to assure that success? Can I, in that same example, can I go do an internship? Can I go take some training? Can I do something to help enable my abilities Mm -hmm. so that even though I don't get to 100%, how can I get to a point where I am more confident in my abilities and in my chance for success? Because the last thing you wanna do is have somebody take a chance and then they're unsuccessful. Um, it might happen despite all your best efforts, but you, at least I, in my opinion, I think you want to try to assure your chances of success as much Mm -hmm. as possible, not meeting hundred percent of the requirements, but ensuring that you at least have a pathway to get there, to feel comfortable, at least as comfortable as you can be. Understood. I might, I might add to that too, Sherry, um, but from a different perspective. You know, we are asked to encourage ourselves to have a growth mindset. And what I've learned is, you know, being a parent of of three children as they were growing up, I actually um, mentioned this to my kids that when you come home from school and there was a point in the day where you struggle, you're actually learning because Mm -hmm. that is the point of expansion. And so in a sense, lean into it and and Tracy is right in that, you know, you, you can't lean into the abyss as well. Um, it has to be at that margin where it's just uncomfortable. It's stretching you beyond your comfort zone, mm-hmm. but it's not totally, totally unknown. So that's the growth mindset. There's so many nuggets that are coming out as you guys are speaking. Sorry, Jen, go ahead. You wanted to also comment. So the growth, the growth mindset, uh, when, when I talk to, and I, and I have a daughter as well, Joyce, that is just starting starting her career. And when I think about her um, and uh, having the tendency to have those perfectionist character characteristics, but encouraging her to have a growth growth minds, mindset and um, almost have it as a, as a game where you want to be told no. Mm. Uh, so you want to stretch yourself um, where you're going to be told no. Um, and problem solve, um, figure out a, a, another another way another way to uh, su- succeed. So I talked about my first uh, professional role. So um, this was with a um, a very large consulting company, and I ended up being successful in recruiting and HR and setting up training and doing all all these. Um, different things around um, human resources, but it wasn't necessarily what I set out, set out to do. And um, while I was recruiting and I was recruiting consultants, I was recruiting consultants to come in and delivery work. um, I had a desire to do that, do that myself. So I went and said that, you know, I wanted to move into, move into consulting and I was told no. Oh, wow. In human resources, you do not have that, that experience. Um, (laughs) I was told, I was told no. So I, um, you know, went to some other parts of the organization to see if I could make it work. And I was told no again. Um, So I started to go interview and I was hired by a very small consulting firm in a delivery role. And um, I was driving at this, at this time, 
Um, I needed to be in the office. I was driving like an hour and 10 minutes um, every day to get into get into the office, but I was successful. It was a very small consulting firm. Um, and I started to do some delivery work where this old consulting firm that I worked for was the, was working. And when they saw the work that I was doing, they brought me back. Uh, and um, I don't know, I, I think about, you know, stretching and mm -hmm. going for things and don't be afraid to, you know, really be told no. I, like I was, there's so many nuggets that you guys are dropping. I don't know if any of you have ever been to poetry slams and know about the poetry slam culture, but they do a lot of snapping when good stuff is being said. And let me tell you, there would have been a lot of snapping. Um, I actually want to zone in on something because I think all of you mentioned it in different ways, right? But the thought of, uh, you know, kind of pushing yourself to your limits and also the idea of confidence, right? So there's a little bit of a buzzword that has been going around for the last few years, the imposter syndrome, right? So many people talk about it. So many people feel like they've experienced it. I know myself, I've been in the industry now for almost 10 years and I still feel like a baby. You know, there's so many things that I always think to myself, oh, I just need to get better at X, Y, and Z. I'm not good enough yet. You know, um, what is it? Have you ladies ever dealt with this term called imposter syndrome? And what did you do to kind of, I guess, snap out of it for lack of better terms? Go ahead, Tracy. Okay. Uh, Jed was off mute, so I thought she was ready to go. So, yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> um, all I would say here is uh, this is something that, as I was relaying earlier, um, I've always had a lot of confidence in my abilities and the strategy that I use to try and be more confident when taking on something new is really to try and use those building blocks from something you've done before. Um, and even, even building on something that Joyce mentioned before. At, at the end of the day, a large portion of the professional work that's out there is solving a problem. Yeah. And it is um, solving, could be, you know, a delivery problem. It could be a new product. So you're solving a problem that nobody knows, knows how to solve for yet, but, but it's solving a problem at the end of the day. And so I always try to go back to just very basic building blocks to try to understand what is the problem. While I might not have a very specific skill set and feel uncomfortable, that again comes back to you have to feel comfortable being uncomfortable. And, you know, now there's limits to that, right? Because you mm -hmm. want to be successful. But at the end of the day, that's always been my my strategy. And in growing up in my career, when I first started, as I mentioned, I started with Centel. And then a couple years after that, I went to EDS and was there for quite a long time through the acquisitions. And I and I did a little bit of everything. Um, you know, I, I got a, hey, can you go be a DBA for these folks? Um, I didn't know. I wasn't a DBA before, but... Mm -hmm. Sure. No problem. Hey, can you go to Buenos Aires and work with a client um, who uh, and you need to work in the local language? I was a little rusty at that point from my Spanish, but um, sure. No, no problem. And so I said yes to a lot of those things. And again, try to use those building blocks from what I had either learned in school or in each role that I took. Um, I always feel like I grabbed a little something from it, it whether mm -hmm. it was a skill, a tactic, a capability, um, whatever it was, I, I feel like you kind of harness those things as you take on different roles. It's one of the reasons why I think doing different things frequently throughout your career mm -hmm. is healthy. And it is very much attached to that growth mindset that Joyce was talking about. And it's about, okay, well, I've been doing this for a little bit. How do I do something a little bit different? And so I would just, I would say, I it's not something that, you know, I've ever really personally felt um, more than just a twinge because then I, you know, smack myself a little bit and get right out of it. But it's, it's something that I realize can be very paralyzing. And, mm -hmm. and so the tactic that I use again is to try and relate it to back to something that I'm a bit more confident in. 
Jan, did you want to go ahead and chime in? Sure. Uh, so two things stick out uh, to me regarding imposter syndrome. Um, so very early in my career, um, I felt it, but was definitely not paralyzed. Um, it was more of a, a challenge and always comfortable. Um, so I would be asked to do do things that you that I'd never done before. I didn't have the experience, but um, I, I felt, you know, that that I could do that. So I had the had the co the confidence. Um, probably kind of mid mid career, as I started to um, do work with more senior uh, senior executives, I felt it more. Um, I was working with a client once, and I was with a colleague, and we were getting ready to go and meet with um, a chief financial officer. And the colleague that I was with was a, was a man, um, and he was a former uh, CFO. So um, we're getting ready for the meeting and doing the prep. And I had shared with him that, you know, I was a little nervous. I felt a little bit of, I didn't use the words imposter syndrome, but that's what I, that's what I felt like because I'm going to give um, advice to a CFO. And I've never been a CFO is, is basically, you know, what I said to him. And um, this stuck with me and it's like snapped me out of it. He said that he feels like an imposter syndrome. He has that every day. Mm -hmm. And he absolutely feels like that as well, um, walking into that, walking into that meeting. So I don't know why that like flipped a switch with me because I, you know, he was a former CFO. He still felt felt like that for for different, different reasons. Um and that was something that really, really helped, helped, helped me. So I confided in a colleague yeah. and, um, you know, was, was able to be snapped out of that thinking. Just like Tracy, actually, I had a similar experience and uh, it happened early in my career before the term imposter syndrome was actually coined. So when I was very, very young, that new grad role that I, you know, took on at Fairchild was when it happened. And I think the important thing was it happened very early in my career. So I've not suffered as much uh, afterwards. Now, let me tell you what happened. I was always solving problems, right? I was connecting engineers across divisions. I was just a problem solver. One day, the director of engineering said, Joyce, we have a problem. Um, We've must, um, you know, we've got this um, ultra small silicon chips and we couldn't mass produce them. They kept on breaking. Can you help us solve the problem? It's an assignment in California. Guess what? I was three years into my role, very green, right? Still green. Three years mm -hmm. is not much for a first job. It was like I jumped at the opportunity. Do you say no? An assignment in the U.S., you know, overseas travel, fun, adventure, <laughs> yes. Um, I arrived. I was met at the airport. I was driven to my apartment. It, has, it had beautiful views of the valley. And I was introduced to the team. Then I had a crisis of confidence. Mm. What? I never asked what the role was. Mm. Can you imagine that? I just said yes. I was leading the team. Now, there was a senior person above me taking mm -hmm. care of me. I think he took care of make, um, buying all the equipment that I ordered <laughs> and the you know experimental things that I did. But I had a crisis of confidence. I was meeting people who had more years in semiconductor processing and manufacturing, mm -hmm. uh, a physicist, a mechanical. I mean, I mean there were just so much more um, experience than I. And like Jen, you know, how can I be leading a team when they have more experience than I? Mm. But over that weekend, as I struggled with, with this feeling of, I'm, I'm going to fail, I'm, why did they choose me? I finally realized they chose me for two things. I was curious. Nothing would be in the way to Joyce's curiosity. You'd find me in finance because I wanted to 
get another vendor in and I was told he's not approved. He'd find me with procurement talking about things. I'd go to the reliability lab at the back of the campus to find out what they're doing with the testing. It's taking too long. Mm -hmm. So, and the second part was I solve problems. Yeah. Because I ask questions even though they might sound foolish. So I settled that my superpower, as we now call it that, was actually being curious and a problem solver. And yes, I don't know everything, which is probably okay, because I'll keep on asking questions. And because of that crisis of confidence early in my career, I learned the lesson really well. So it kind of sounds like the common theme among all of you, all of your stories is, you know, there, there came a point where you realized, okay, there's a reason why I'm here, right? And also I, there, you have to have some intrinsic, almost like, okay, I don't feel like I'm in the right place. I don't feel like I'm qualified, but I'm here and I'm just going to put my best foot forward regardless. Um, and I actually, Jen, there's something that you said that really caught my attention. You said the person that encouraged you was one of your male colleagues. And I think, you know, I know it's International Women's Day and we're celebrating women in the industry. But I am curious, you know, who have been the most influential folks in your careers, whether it be male or female, and exactly how did they impact either the trajectory of your career or even just that particular stage in your career? Um, so, so I had, um, when I, when I think back on, on my career, I've actually been really, really lucky to work with so many talented individuals, men, women, people who are further in their career, just starting their career. And, uh, it's one of the things that I am most thankful for is due to me saying yes to all of these crazy things. I got to work with a lot of different folks and, uh, that was really special to me. And when I think back on my career, I, I wouldn't change that for anything, even though it might have meant that, um, you know, some of the roles that I wanted took a little longer to achieve. Mm -hmm. So I took a zig and a zag instead of a, a linear route. Yeah. Um, I, I still I, you know, I look back on that and I, and I wouldn't change it for anything. But the, the two, when I think about um, influential folks, um, I, I've had a couple and um, I'll just mention um, a few. So there was um, one, uh, it was a woman that I worked for. Um, I was doing an assignment in Maryland and I was uh, TDY, as we used to call it uh, back in the day. So temporary duty. Um, so I was living there and I had an apartment and um, she really taught me about taking care of people. And, mm -hmm. and that is something that I think is, is a little bit of an art. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very large organization there and I worked with her and uh, she was very focused on ensuring that her team was very taken care, very well taken care of. And that took the form of birthday cards, leaving a snack on someone's desk if they were having a tough day. And this was somebody who was a, a vice president. This was not a lower level leader. Yeah. This, this was somebody who took the time to do these things and she would you know, she would have get togethers at her house um, every few months and invite everybody over. Um, and she really created an environment that was just very, very special. And, and I and I remember that to this day. I actually still get Christmas cards from her. Aww. I sent her a Christmas card. Um, so very, very special and influential. Um, and, and I have two more and I'll go quickly. Um, the other one I'll mention was a male that I worked with in this first job when I was going to be a visual basic developer. Um, he was a very technical resource and um, this was my first professional job. So, and I don't know anybody. Remember, mm -hmm. if you remember my story, I don't know. I don't know a single person except this one guy that I had probably met 10 years prior when I was like five or six years old. I mean, it was, it was a lot to take in. And, um, and he really took the time to make me feel comfortable. And he really took the time to ensure that 
again, you relate these technical challenges. We were doing coding and development and so on and so forth. And when I would run into problems, he, he would always kind of, again, take a step back and walk through the problem, try to, again, troubleshoot through it, knowing what you know. But some of those things can really be very panicked. Um, and back in those days, there weren't a lot of good debugging tools. And so it really was hard when you were doing development to try to sort through where, where some of those problems might be. And so he really projected that aura of calmness, you know, you can figure it out. Yeah. And, I, and I attribute a lot of me being able to relate things back to, you know, really just something I've done before or something that is very solvable, um, to him and, and, and the time that we would spend. And um, most importantly, um, in, in my first professional job, we would spend 10 minutes every morning working on the crossword together. Uh -huh. um, and again, it was a very people oriented thing. Like he didn't have to do that. He right. had been in his career for a long time. And you know, we'd, we'd had, there was another colleague and we would sit together, the three of us, while we had our first cup of coffee for the day um, and we would work on the crossword. And mm -hmm. um, whew, I was not very good in the beginning, uh, much, much better by the end, as you get into a rhythm, you do get better at doing crossword puzzles. Um, and then the last person I'll mention, um, I worked for when I was at HP and she really, I had worked with clients all over the world, but what she really reminded me of was taking care of clients. So I talked about my one mentor who was about taking care of your people. And she was really all about taking care of your clients. And mm -hmm. she would get to the heart of the matter. So the client might go off for 40 minutes about something that was wrong, but she would always be able to dive right into where, where was the challenge and ensuring that that problem got solved. Yeah. And, it, and it's very easy sometimes to get to get panicked again when a client is upset or there's problems because let's face it, there are problems uh, on occasion out there. Um, but really the way that she dealt with clients and took care of clients was very special. And yeah. I'm, I feel very lucky having worked with her and um, in her experience and just how she approached everything was just spectacular. So I, again, very, very fortunate and, and really have enjoyed working with everyone. But those, those are some of my standouts. Thanks, Tracy. You actually inspired me to share a little bit of my story. Um, the first person that kind of stuck a hand out to kind of save me from drowning, <laughs> as I would have put it at the time. Um, I'm not going to say his name, but you all know who he is. Uh, and he uh, basically taught me the value of working on things that were number one, visible, and number two, adding value versus just another small operational thing, which at the time in my career, I didn't even, I, I couldn't uh, differentiate, right? At the time, everything I did must be important to this large firm, right? Um, but, and he kind of taught me that, which I don't know, I would, I don't know that I would have done it as quickly had he not specifically said, this is how you're going to advance in life or in, in your career. And the second person um, was a woman. And I really appreciated her in a totally different and very emotional way. Uh, I got married and had kids at 22 and 23. So I was really young and I was still early on in my career. Um, I was kind of looking all around the room trying to figure out, okay, I know I can do this but this is really hard. Is there anybody out there that knows what this feels like? And it just felt like I couldn't find anybody. And so I was really struggling. Uh, I was introduced to this woman in, 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 in the firm who became one of my mentors. And I think she was the first person um, that I could look to and kind of say, oh, that's what it looks like to juggle these things. Oh, that's what it looks like to be successful 
even though you have all of these things going on um, that you thought were a huge challenge. Well, you know, if she can do it, you can too. So just keep going, um, you know, and, and she was very, she could, because of her experience and because there were so many things that we related on, she could very specifically say, okay, Shri, here's how we're going to do X, Y, and Z with all of the things that you're dealing with. And so, yeah, to your, I mean, to your point, Tracy, I've worked with a lot of people, a lot of wonderful people who have helped me through my career. Um, but I, I did see a difference in that particular situation because, you know, not everybody is a mom or not everybody is a wife, you know, and so there's certain, there's certain u- unique challenges when, when you have that particular type of situation, but let me not take too much time. Did anybody else want to speak on this? Go ahead, Jen. Yes. Um, so I have, um, a woman that was a mentor and, what I learned from her is um, the need to have diverse teams. Mm. So one of the things that she worked on was not um, building her organization with people that were just like her. She really looked for diverse teams. And um, there's two things that stood out that she, that she did uh, that I was so impressed with. Um, so all of you probably have been in, um, in training where you, you take a a personality profile test and, um, she called her team together and she had everyone take this personality profile test. And then she had you go stand in the room based on where you, where you sat as far as fitting in the, in the personality profile. And I don't know if you've, if anyone has ever done this before with a, a group of people that you work with, but when I've done this with other firms or companies, you will notice something. Traditionally you have everyone all bunched up in one area and then a few outliners. Well, her team was very well dispersed and she did this not to point or call out uh, people, but to show the importance of uh, diversity. So that has been something that has always, um, always stuck with me. Um, The other thing that she helped me with um, is addressing things, difficult things that head on. So whether it be with a client or something that's going on within your, within your corporation, Um, we were working at, at the time where there was a crisis with the company, some uh, major crisis. Um, wasn't like a pandemic, but it was still a major crisis for for the company. Um, And people were very concerned for their jobs. And she called everyone in the room and actually gave them the mic, had them come up on, you know, in front of everyone. Um, You weren't forced to if you weren't comfortable, but had people like get it out. So the rumor, rumor mill was rampant. Um, but to have everyone get it out, um, she was a phenomenal mentor because she really looked at um, leveraging people's strengths mm-hmm. and building a team where you had, you know, a, a lot of diversity. Yeah, I love that. My mentors actually have, many of them have become my advisors. So I've got a board of advisors and they come from different parts of you know my work life as well as people I have met socially and one of them stands out Um, he's the ex-CEO of a firm here in Australia and New Zealand and he and I uh, share similar values and faith and I've met his family he's met my family and so his advice to me is really around the big career changes that I have made. It's good to have someone who's not in the situation Mm. uh, to actually reflect on uh, my own, you know, perspective and my options. Sometimes I say I have these options and he says, are you sure those are your only options? Mm. So he's a safe person to speak to. Uh, during those times when I feel like quitting, for example, <laughs> because uh, he, he brings calmness and a very considered approach to the discussion. And I trust him because he knows me personally. It's not just 
you know, knowing me at work. And of course, I don't work for him anymore. That's mm -hmm. also the safe thing. Um, but the other one was a, a woman mm -hmm. who gave me a big break and basically asked me to lead a global transformation program for Nortel Networks. And that was a big thing because um, it, it was moving my family from Sydney to Raleigh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. One of the things that she did was similar to what your mentor did, Tracy, which is that really put a personal touch to the care that she, she, she expressed for me. So I wasn't just someone at work doing this massive program for the company. I was also a, a woman with a family. I mean, can you imagine your boss coming to your front door wow. with some uniforms for your children because what you ordered hasn't arrived? Mm. So similar to the, you know, the cards and, and having puzzles, she just really put, and she, but that was really practical, but also really loving and caring. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing. So both of them have become advisors, not just mentors. That's awesome. So I'm, I'm, I'm digesting everything that everybody is saying. This is such good stuff. We don't have too much more time. Otherwise, I would dwell here a little bit longer. I do want to shift a little bit um, and talk about in your career, right, was there ever a time in which you felt like you had to make a sacrifice to get to the next level? What was that? Not, maybe you don't have to share what the sacrifice was, but do you feel like it was worth it? Um, and, and yes, maybe share, you know, what that challenge was like to experience during that time in your career. So for me, um, it's a little different. Um, I, I guess I've never considered um, the word sacrifice when I think about the different roles that I've taken over the years. Um, I, I choose to think about as making choices and um, and there's just different ways to adapt to those choices. And, and maybe maybe I'm just playing word games with myself. But, um, you know, I have two children, um, two great boys. They can't hear me, so I can say that. Um, but uh, <laughs> super kids. And, you know, I've traveled since they were little. I traveled before they were born. I traveled right up until they were both born. And then um, thereafter, I, I, I traveled very shortly thereafter, depending on which kid I'm talking about. But... Um, I think of it as I made choices. And I, I think I shared this with you a little bit, Cherie, when we were talking before is I thought of it as, okay, what, what do I and my family need at this point in time and how can I enable that? So mm -hmm. um, as an example, when my first, my older son was born, um, he was easy baby. Of course, I was very lucky, um, very happy kid. Um, and so, you know, I hit the road shortly after he was born. I went back to work shortly after he was born and, and I went back and traveled and, and my husband and I, we worked it out. And it was just one of those things where, you know, the, the, the biggest adjustment is I can be a little bit of a control freak. Um, anybody who works with me would know that, but it had to be again, okay, that when I wasn't home, things got done my husband's way. That's not the wrong way, just his way. And <laughs> um, trying to get adjusted to that. Um, but again, it was a choice, right? And I think of it as a, as a choice. Now, when my younger son was born, um, he spent a little time in the NICU after he was born. And so so I hung around the, ho the house a little bit longer. So I took a role that kept me at my home base here in Michigan a little bit longer where I wasn't hitting the road. So, you know, I, I think of those things as choices that you make based on where you are in your personal life, where your family is, what your personal situation is, what's going on in the, the place that you work. And you, and you really kind of put all those things together and you try to come out with something that works for you. And sometimes that means 
you go ask for a role that doesn't exist and you say why it needs to exist or mm. you put yourself in something that's maybe a lateral move instead of an upwards move. But you make those choices very, in my opinion, making those choices very consciously is really important. And, and that's why when I think about that, I don't think about that as, as sacrifices. And again, when I think about that zigzag, whenever I describe my career, that's always what I what I use as a um, uh, to describe it is I think those are very conscious choices and, and you and you make the best choice you can based on what's going on and what are all the environmental factors and everything else at, at any given time. And and I know that may be a different perspective from from most, but I that's what's worked for us and in yeah. my family and and us being able to get through, you know, my career and the and and the things that I've been able to do over over the last couple of decades. Yeah, I resonate with the word choices. I, I don't think you're playing word games, Tracy. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's choices. And also, it's really about just at, at the time of your life, what is the best choice for mm -hmm. you and the family as a whole? And, and similar to Tracy, I made a choice. I declined a role which would have given me a promotion to... Mm -hmm you know, vice president level for, for Japan in this global company. My children were young. I was pregnant at the time as well. I just didn't feel it was the right time. And, you know, when the right role did come, uh, it came anyway. And it was a better fit for me. Mm. And so the choices that I made, I, I don't have regrets. Mm -hmm. Now, there are the choices... Um, for example, like traveling shortly after uh, the first baby was born and not being there for the first, the few milestones. Uh, mm -hmm. Some I felt guilty at the time, but then I realized I could bring my work experience home. And what do I mean by that? Well, my daughter, when she was four, realized that I was bringing home various currencies and paper bills and I was sorting them because you know you you know the British pound doesn't go with the US dollar <laughs> you, get, you have they, you put them in different pockets and 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 so she actually learned foreign currency so she went to her uh, preschool and had a show and tell about foreign currency oh, and uh, my son so too did the these, same thing <laughs> That yeah, awesome. so so mm -hmm. so you involve them with the work, but not, and so they they learned about business transformation um, actually quite young, because when I moved the family ages five, eight, and eleven to Raleigh, North Carolina, they had a change workshop at home and the kitchen table. <laughs> That's what good. could go wrong? Yeah. You know, what could go wrong? What could go really well, and what would we do if things go wrong? And, and there, you know, just applied my, my skills onto my family. So choices. What about you, Jen? I agree completely choices. I don't think about it as sacrifice. Um, and I really relate to Tracy be because I have two, two children like Tracy. Um, and my, I've always traveled. Um, my kids are, one is in college and one is just starting, um, starting her career, but I've always traveled like their entire life. I have always traveled and my husband has been home with them. So the choices are more related to, he's not going to do things the same way that I will do them mm. and having, I need to be okay with that. Or if I'm not okay with that, then I'm going to make another choice and not um, continue to have a career that requires, requires mm. travel. Um, I don't regret it at all. Um, my kids, I'm very close to my kids. I've always been very close to my kids, um, but I have been able um, to make it work with my husband by making making choices. But you have to be flexible because if um, if I wanted it done the way that I might do it, it, it wouldn't wouldn't work. I do have one thing that I want to want to share where I think that I made a choice that was not beneficial. And I, and I just, just want to share it because, and it's, it's quite personal, but um, 
because I feel like it, it could be, you know, it, it, it was a big lesson learned, lesson learned for me. So um, when I was um, pregnant with my son, who is my second, second child, I started a new, a new job, a new company. I started with a new company. And when I inter was interviewing with this company, I was um, pregnant. Um, when it, it was a long interview process, by the time I was getting a, getting an offer, I revealed to this employer that I was, was pregnant mm -hmm. and, um, they wanted to move forward and they did extend an, a, an offer. Um, by the time I really started, it was more apparent that I was, <laughs> I was pregnant. I was about six months, six months pregnant. And I was working, um, with, uh, for a man that, um, would not, did not really want to engage with me because mm. he didn't want to introduce me to our clients yet because yeah. he said, you're going to go on maternity leave. And he said, this is your second child. So what I find when women have uh, their second child is most likely they might not really even come back. So he said it was a risk to him to, to introduce, introduce him, introduce, introduce me. So I tried to assure him that that, that wasn't the case and, you know, do everything that, that I could to, um, not have nothing to do for, mm. you know, the rest of the time that I was, that I was working. So I was able to, you know, insert myself into some meetings and I was able to do a little bit of work with, uh, work with the client, but was, was held a little bit at, at bay. Um, after I had my, after I had my son, there was an, an opportunity to have a, uh, a meeting with a meeting with the client. My son was, um, only two weeks old at that, at that time. Wow. And I went to the meeting. Wow. Um, and it was a disaster. It was supposed to be a, uh, a quick trip. It was supposed to be a 45 minute flight. Um, I got up at three 30 in the morning to take a very early, early flight. And, um, you know how airlines are. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't a quick trip. I got home two days later and it would, and it was very, very difficult. Um, this company that I was working for is a very well-respected company. And despite the fact that there was this one individual that had this thought, um, I had through the company, um, an actual coach. So they provided coach, a coach to work with women that are, um, dealing with what I was dealing with. And I, I uh, remember breaking down and talking to the coach that this wasn't going to work. I thought that I could make it work, but I can't. And, and um, this coach said, how often do you have children? Are you, are you mm -hmm. going to have one every year? This isn't too much to ask. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be, be successful. You don't need to, you know, you don't need to take these extreme, um, extreme measures. And um, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it made sense. Um, mm -hmm. I did end up taking then, um, I didn't take probably as much maternity leave as, um, you know, was really, really offered, but I was ready to, and excited to get back to work. Um, I didn't come back really after two weeks. I, I knew that that was a, that was a mistake, but, um, I don't know. I share that because it wasn't a time where I felt that I was, I was pressured, but I put the pressure on pressure on myself and allowed someone else, yeah. um, you know, to put that, put that pressure, um, but, you know, it does say something for, and I think somebody mentioned it earlier, it says something about sometimes we're just too much in our own heads, that it's always helpful to have an outsider say, hey, listen, it's going to be okay. <laughs> um, and, and it just shows how much, how much as a society we need each other to be mindful of each other and to pull somebody out of this chaos that's going on in our heads and to encourage each other. So I really appreciated everybody's uh, story. Shifting gears just one more time. Um, there are a few people who feel, not a few, there are people out there that feel like there's still not enough women leadership in a lot of companies. So from your perspective, what do you think is the biggest challenge for companies to have women leadership and what can they do to overcome these challenges? Jen, you want to go first? Sure. I um, flexibility, uh, allowing flexibility. I, 
we used to talk about on and off ramps. So um, there might be times in your in your career where you want to do a lot of a lot of traveling and you're very very comfortable. And there might be times when you want want to a cut back. So for um, employers to be open to still giving opportunities. Um, to people that might have different times in their careers that they want to have have, have flexibility. Uh, I work in an industry um, where there are a lot of women leaders. So I I, uh, I do most of my work in the life science industry. So working with some of the larger pharmaceutical medical device companies, and I have many uh, clients that the CIO is a woman, the CFO is a woman. The chief procurement office is a is a woman, um, so I I do see progress being made specifically in in that in that sub industry. What about you, Tracy? So I think I think there is progress being made. To Jen's point, I, I think this I think this comes back to honestly women being confident about moving up the ladder, even if they don't have all the skills. And it comes mm -hmm. back to kind of our very first couple of questions, I think. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's part of the challenge. I think Jen's point on flexibility, I think is also very, very well made that, you know, again, someone like me who has zigs and zags and maybe didn't take a, a traditional route uh, doesn't mean I'm less qualified, just means that my background is a little bit different. Just like Joyce's story about being a chemical engineer and not, not an electrical and mechanical engineer for the, for the role. So I think it's understanding that everyone's background um, isn't going to follow the same path and understanding that that's actually a plus. It's not a negative. And I think there's there's still some evolution to that way of thinking that's needed that, you know, a, a very diverse background doesn't necessarily mean that you're not a good fit for a particular role because everyone who came before you had kind of this straight line or yeah. this set of experience. And so I think there is progress. I think there is still more that needs to be made. And I, and I think it does come down to, we need more women to apply for those positions. Now, you don't really apply to be the CEO of a company. I understand that. But again, getting women into more senior level roles will ultimately make the pool of people that are viewed as candidates for those types of positions will increase the pool size, which I think will increase the ability for more of those roles to be filled by women, quite frankly. I agree with uh, Jen and Tracy that things actually are improving. I mean, I come from the world of technology. Uh, before ISG, I was the CIO and I studied cybersecurity. And what I found is um, I've been to a recent cybersecurity conference and there's many young women. Wow. I feel yeah. like, wow. Yeah. It, they, yeah, there were many young women because it's actually really valuable to have diversity when you're looking at a cybersecurity threat. And I remember really um, very excited when we had our SOC and the analyst was a woman assigned to our account. And I was just saying, yeah, but th there's more coming. The supply is low for um, those coming to science, technology, and engineering degrees. There's fewer women in those. And I think we see that in, in the technology business. And I think it's, we encourage more young women to, to study the technology uh, type courses because um, I think the supply, need, so supply problem is still there. Mm. And it's a two-way street. Um, I think an honest conversation is needed. Uh, women tend to, to keep their own confidences. And so if someone's uncomfortable or wanting to, to do something different, the company has to create a, a zone of psychological safety so these conversations can be had. And uh, we are just really 
blessed, I think, Tracy, Jen, and I, that through our journeys, we could have those conversations with people we were working with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ladies, this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for being just so transparent, so willing to just share your experiences. I really have learned a lot I'm taking mental notes. I hope uh, our events team is able to kind of put some of the things you said in quotations because there are so many good things that were shared throughout this whole conversation. But we are out of time. I wish we had more time. Um, so we are just going to go ahead and wrap this up again. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today from APAC and the Americas. We are so happy that you are part of the conversation. And hopefully, if you have any questions that you want answered, um, we're still willing to, to answer them, as I said earlier. So send them in, and we'll get the answers to you as soon as we can. And we hope you have a great day. Bye, everyone. <laughs>